Well, thank you for the invitation, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be the last speaker. And I must say it's uh, great that this meeting uh, runs very, very well on time. So I'm going to talk about the new developments in uh, mesothelioma. And uh, yes, these are my disclosures. And I want to talk about new diagnostics, a little bit on the angiogenesis, personalized treatment, immunotherapy, of course, and whether there are other drugs. So you must always keep in mind with mesothelioma that uh, the disease is not that easy. We think we have only three types, the epithelioid, the sarcomatoid, and mixed version. But if you look closely to the epithelioid type, there are about eight subdivisions. And like the pleomorphic, they do behave more like a sarcomatoid one and you have papillary ones that can stay on for many, many months or even years without having to treat them. So you must always keep in mind that comparing the results from studies can be difficult. The numbers of sm are small. In the UK, for instance, you have about 2,500 new cases per year. In the Netherlands, about 500, 600. And of course, response measurement, as in the lower corner, it's very difficult. You have the fluid, you have uh, fibrotic uh, tissue, and of course you cannot always measure it in the proper way. So you must use modified resist criteria or something else. Now this is the standard from 2003, and I would like to have your attention on the median overall survival, which is about 12 months. And it proved to be that pimetrexid with cisplatin was superior than cisplatin alone. But until now, we do not have a second line therapy which is defined. What about diagnostics? It's difficult to get a diagnosis, but maybe in the near future, we will have this uh, opportunity to use an e nose that will measure volatile organic compounds in the exhales a breath of a patient, and you can identify, just like a dog can sniff whether a patient is sick or he or she has some uh, uh, substances uh, swallowed uh, huh, that they want to smuggle, uh, whether the patient has a memory carcinoma, lung cancer, or even mesothelioma. And there are some, some studies that already have addressed this um, issue. So maybe diagnosis and also follow-up might become more easy. If we look at the anti-angiogenesis, until 2013, it has been not so very good. We had a study from Hedy Kindler, where there was, of the addition of bevacizumab to cisplatin gemcitabine, one of the standards, or the other standards, did not show any benefit. And if you looked at a, a single agent carbo pimetrexid, median survival time was interesting, but 15 months single agent, oh, sorry, single arm, that does not make, uh, yeah, good, doesn't give you a clue whether it's really better. There was a randomized phase three study from the Netherlands with thalidomide as a maintenance, also anti-angiogenic, and the hazard ratio was 1.0. So, giving it did not make any big difference in the time to progression, but there was a small advantage in the median survival time, even uh, not an advantage in for the thalidomide, but for the control arm. And the oral uh, multi-target uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been reported with conflicting results. So how could you identify a drug uh, anti uh, antigenic drug uh, in a small group of patients, whether it works or not. And we decided to do this kind of approach, where we were wanted to test a, what we call a dirty TKI, exitinib, a Pfizer drug, which is anti-VEGF receptor, PGGFF, and, uh, and you can give it with uh, only some minor side effects. And we've added it to the chemotherapy and compared it to the chemotherapy alone. And here is the schedule that we first did a thoracoscopy or large biopsies and repeated that after nine weeks, so after three courses of the treatment. 
And of course, it was correlated to the CT scan. And what we hoped that we could find early identifiers for, uh, to sort out patients who might benefit from this kind of treatment. So this is a nice example of the thoracoscopies. You see that the chemotherapy, with or without the drug, this was with the drug, that all these tumor nodules on the parietal pleura disappeared, but there are still a few left. But did the drug work? Well, here the hazard ratio is also about one. So in a group of 31 patients, we could demonstrate that with a mild toxicity, there was not an overall survival gain. We did some nice translational research, and this will be published in one of the next uh, issues from uh, GTO. We did find that the microvessel count reduced in the group that was treated with exitinib, and that the, the VEGF showed enormous rebound phenomena. So if you stop the drug just for your uh, thoracoscopy or for your uh, uh, new treatment, uh, you saw that it, it went up with a factor of 5 to 10. There is a new study recently reported. It took eight years to complete this one because it was a scheduled phase two, three study. Uh, from the French group, uh, the MAPS study, and they randomized patients with mesothelioma who were bevacizumab eligible to receive the standard of care, six courses of cisplatin pemetrexid, or the same drug combination with bevacizumab. And they looked at the phase two study and reported that it was feasible no unsuspected toxicity, and they went on to uh, uh, accomplish the study with 448 patients. Now, the re uh, results are shown here in the overall uh, uh, survival. And if we now look at the control arm, the control arm already is 16 months, so that is much higher than the 12.3 months that Vogelsang had in 2003. So you could argue that the selection of bevacizumab suitable, uh, eligible patients could make the difference. And I think also the fact that there were many patients lined up in the period that the Vogelsang study was executed, that we entered everybody, also with a performance status of two probably. So this might account for the difference. The drugs have not changed. But if you gave bevacizumab, there was a, an addition of 2.8 months. And for some countries, that might become the new standard. So this is a possibility that you have uh, a reason for bevacizumab. Well, how about personalized treatment? We would like to identify also which kind of drug would be best to give to a patient. And therefore, we developed a sort of a test where we took patients' own pleural fluid and used it to culture mesothelioma cells and do drug screens. And here you see that if you take the pleural fluid out and you do a primary culture, you can have an analysis, the DNA, of course, uh, sequencing, and you can expose them to all kinds of concentrations as long as you have enough cells. And it's important to say that this could be done in two to three weeks. So you don't have to wait for a sort of animal model or experimental model three months down the line because then your patient has died already. And we started a study where we uh, tested all these kind of drugs like cisplatin, oxaliplatin, gemcitabine, and here is the drug concentration on the horizontal axis and the survival fraction of cells on the vertical axis. So we start with 100%. And of course, with every drug, you can kill everything as long as the concentration is high enough. But if you are here in the nanomolar range, you're talking about concentrations that we can get in the plasma of patients. And this, for instance, is considered to be a responder there are a number of drugs that kill the cells immediately. 
but there are also, in this case, a few that do not respond. You have an intermediate group, and you have a group where the concentrations have to be too high. So we said, we are going to look at three studies in the responders, a minimax analysis. We have to have four responders or stable disease in seven patients for the intermediate and the non-responders. And then we can see if, if our approach works. And now we are treating sometimes patients with uh, other kinds, doxorubicin or uh, uh, gemcitabin or finorelbin or combinations, whatever is the best. How about immunotherapy? We know from anecdotal reports that patients who were exposed to uh, BCG uh, installation had longer survival, but nobody has really taken the time to write it down uh, correctly. And patients who had an empyema due to a surgical procedure or just by chance might also live somewhat longer. We know from historic and also uh, prospective studies that uh, PDL1 expression is uh, found in about 40% to 55-60% of cases, depending on what kind of uh, tumor you have. And therefore, different approaches have been already put in place. The trimolimumab, the data, uh, has just come out this week that the, this drug as a CTL4 agent, as a single agent in mesothelioma, does not give any benefit. So this is a very hot news, but it's unfortunately not positive. So the first study that drew our attention was this phase 1b study in the keynote 28, where patients uh, in a sort of a basket trial were exposed to pembrolizumab. And they, uh, if they had a complete or partial response, they could continue up to two years. And here you see the waterfall plot that <clears throat> if you consider this to be disease control, 78% uh, had disease control with a very nice proportion of patients who had been treated um, with many other drugs before. So there might be a good way forward with it. We decided to look more in detail to one kind of drug, that's nivolumab, in patients with recurrent mesothelioma who were able to uh, have a thoracoscopy like I've showed in the previous ones with the exitinib. The drug was given every two weeks and we look at the disease control rate at 12 weeks. So very big translational research part in our institution, looking at all kinds of uh, tumor cells, infiltration, uh, NGS, tetramers, etc. And, and it's uh, shown here also with the thoracoscopy or large biopsies. And after week six, we already do the biopsies because then we think already there must have been enough uh, time for the immune system to uh, be modulated and to send in their uh, T cells. We had calculated that we needed 33 patients and uh, well, the inclusion rate is, is, is so good that we are already here in March, we are here at 38 and we have just uh, stopped the trial. So we are waiting for uh, the results, and we hope to publish this, this or report it uh, at the end of the year, maybe at the world long. But there's also toxicity, and you're not uh, playing with uh, innocent drugs. This was a young uh, patient with a limited uh, mesothelioma on the left side, and we gave him one uh, injection with uh, nivolumab, and he became almost respiratory uh, insufficient, he had to be admitted, could not eat at nausea. There was a huge swelling, extraterrestrial, and a large infiltration in the left lower lobe. We had him in house for about uh, four weeks, and we thought we were going to lose him. Uh, we gave him high dose steroids, and then at the outpatient clinic, he came walking in, 
and this was the result in October. So even one injection can uh, change the whole immune system uh, very, very uh, uh, impressively. But uh, unfortunately, we did not dare to uh, re-challenge him and he, uh, he is now progressive, uh, suffering from progressive disease. So there's an ETOP study which looks at the uh, pembrolizumab as a sort of uh, second-line treatment. You can randomize it for a uh, dealer's choice chemotherapy, single agent, or pembrolizumab in a fixed dose. And this is a study that is only being run in the UK and in Switzerland. Other study of importance to note is a study from Joachim Aert, and uh, we work together also with Dean and uh, Jan van Meerbeek and from and Italy and, and France. This is called the DEMIN trial, where we have monocytes taken from the body and then they're exposed to an allogenic tumor lysate, five st uh, strains, and they are more or less trained to recognize um, mesothelioma antigens. And then they're activated to become mature dendritic cells and they're inserted in the body. And this is a study that will probably start somewhere in September. We also have a live attenuated double deleted listeria, monocytogenes, and this is a, a, a bacteria which has been um, make, uh, made, uh, deleted two genes, one to prevent to enter hepatocytes, that's one of the major side effects, and one to uh, avoid that bacterial DNA is spread out. So these are then exposed to mesothelin, and they are very much uh, targeted to dendritic cells. They've been uptaken, and uh, in the cytoplasm, they will uh, show their uh, antigen and then you have an immune response. And the initial uh, data that uh, were presented, I'm going to show you here, is that in first-line treatment already a huge amount of patients had responses, partial responses, and about 90% had disease control. So this is also something that is very interesting and the company is now looking for a phase three study. And in my last few seconds, I will merely tell you that there are many, many studies with uh, Adipac, Amatoximab, uh, the MARS-2, that's a surgical study. The ERTC is looking at a surgical question, doing how to do a pleurectomy decortication, which is very, very important. And this is the ERTC study from... Uh, Sanjay Popat looking at nitindinib as a maintenance. And we have the ADIPAC, that's also an interesting study from the UK with arginine deprivation of mesothelioma cells. And uh, this study might also be run uh, in Europe, but we have to wait what Peter Slosserek will do on this. The Dean Fennell has a, a CRUK study, the MISO2, looking at uh, uh, Ganetta's PIP, of which he discussed this morning, to see whether mesothelioma is one of the uh, diseases where this drug could be very active. So my conclusions are there are many, many studies now in the first and second line, so it's a very high competition rate. We really must pick the best. Immunomodulation uh, is still hot. I think the combination of CTL4 and checkpoint inhibitors are interesting. And targeting mesothelin, as we know from a lot of other studies, is probably also a good way forward. So there's a lot of attention in mesothelioma. Thank you for your attention. Okay.